being from the South, I know a thing or two about how bugs can ruin a great outdoor experience. It's crazy how something so small can affect some of the potentially greatest experiences of your life. And that's why today's show is brought to you in part by Sawyer. You might know them as the water filter company. I actually have a couple Sawyer filters, but they make a lot of other great products too, including their insect repellent. And uh, j- just some points about what it is. It's great for the whole family. It's actually safe to use on infants and those who are pregnant because they don't use DEET, the active ingredient. They use something better called picaridin. It actually lasts longer. It lasts up to 12 hours. Pretty incredible. And it doesn't damage any of your gear. So it's insect repellent specifically made for families who are also outdoorsy because it won't ruin any of that high dollar gear that you've bought to be out there. And it does a fantastic job of protecting you and your family from those vector-borne illnesses that are carried by insects. I know for me, I'm always carrying some insect repellent because I've had mosquitoes specifically ruin some pretty incredible backpacking experiences. Don't let it happen to you. Use Sawyer's 20% Picaridin insect repellents. Find out more about that at sawyer.com. Play safe, travel safely. Sawyer, they keep you outdoors. And I just distinctly remember going up onto the rocks above this rapid to scout it which is what we would do for all the big rapids and taking a look at it and not knowing you know if i was going to be able to be strong enough to get this boat through this is the adventure sports podcast where we hear stories of adventure from every corner of the planet we interview all sorts of folks who are using their sport to explore the world around them and give you the inspiration you need to get out there and have some fun Happy Throwback Thursday, everybody. I'm your host, Mason Gravely, but actually I'm not hosting today's episode. This is a Throwback Thursday episode, like I just said, and this one's going back almost four years. So this was before I was the host. This was was, was when Travis and Kurt were hosting the show. Travis specifically will be talking to Heather Kelly, the founder of Heather's Choice Meals. You may have heard of Heather through that, but four years ago, Heather did this amazing 25-day rafting trip to the Grand Canyon, truly a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I know a lot of us out there would love to do that, myself included. Never done it. I've hiked the Grand Canyon, but not, not rafted it, so that would be epic. But anyway, we're going to hear her story and also just generally be inspired. So I hope this inspires you. And for everybody that's out there on an adventure right now, I just want to say we love hearing from you. Uh, We thank you for what you're doing, getting out there, and also inspiring adventure. We just hope this encourages you in some way and this keeps you going in some way. And if it does, please reach out. Our email is info at Adventure Sports Podcast. Dot com. Keep getting out there and have some fun. Hey, thanks, Travis. It's good to have you. So let's get into your background a little bit uh, before we get into the uh, the rafting uh, and pack rafting stuff. You were raised in Alaska and you still live up there uh, to this day, right? Yep. Bird Creek is home sweet home. <laughs> Bird Creek. And where is Bird Creek? It's just south of Anchorage, about 25 miles. So if folks were driving down the Seward Highway and they saw a gas station and a motel, that would be it. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Now I looked up Bird Creek because I was curious. And I think, I mean, I was literally counting the houses on Google Earth and I might have come up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 35. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that's probably pretty accurate. <laughs> My grandparents actually did some of the first homesteading in that area back in the 1950s. So we've got a beautiful two and a half acres butted up against the Chugach National Forest. That's awesome. And you're on a cove down in there. Yeah, in there. it's awesome. So I imagine that's probably uh, one of the reasons you got started in uh, in kayaking and rafting. Yeah, you know, I started guiding rafts when I was 18 up here in Alaska and uh, had a job that was just down the road. But it was a really unique trip because we would drive to the train station and then get onto the train with all of our customers and then ride out to this great big glacier where the train would drop us off in literally middle of nowhere. You can't access it by road. 
And then we would float these rafts around icebergs, touring the glacier, and then down this glacial fed river back to where the train would pick us up. So that was a pretty awesome first job. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. That beats uh, working at the the local Burger King. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So you guys actually took the train out there. They could get to bypass the old van and, and stacked rafts on the trailer. That's a, that's a pretty cool Yeah, it was a concept. very fun trip. <laughs> So as a kid, you were, I imagine you were a pretty adventurous kid bombing around in the in the woods up there. You got plenty of land to roam. Well, yeah, I definitely did a lot of picking blueberries and raspberries. And my mom would uh, tie bells on me to scare off bears if I was playing in the backyard. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it comes with the territory. You got to be looking out for moose, black bears, brown bears. And we did a lot of salmon fishing. So Alaska is a great place to grow up. That's cool. So other than doing the, the rafting and, and uh, kayaking that you've done, what other hobbies have you taken part of up there? Man, up here, I've really gotten geeked on gardening. So this year we have about 400 square feet or more of gardening space. And our gardening season is super short. We basically have to start everything inside and then it might be ready to go outside come May 15th, but it could still be too cold. And then everything needs to be out of the ground by end of August. So it's kind of extreme gardening, if you will. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Was that born from wanting to dehydrate foods or were you into that prior? Well, you know, definitely dehydrated food and food preservation and all of that is a very big interest of mine. You know, where we live, we're not that far outside of the city, but we're far enough out that we do get more power outages and we've had times that we've been stuck there due to avalanches on the highway. And so I feel like for us, it's just this innate sense that we need to have a little bit of self-sufficiency. So we're kind of looking to stock up for the winter, get the freezer all packed, make sure the pantry is all packed. And uh, like I say, stocking up for the winter means we need to start now <laughs> in order to be ready come September. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. You don't have much time to work with it for sure. So let's get into some of the the rafting and the and the pack rafting. Let's start with with rafting itself. Um, you actually in college you were a rower, uh, two time NCAA national championship in women's rowing. You you started out fairly early and uh, and won some some serious uh, awards doing it. How did you end up getting into into rowing specifically? Yeah, when I was first getting into rafting, I was 18 years old and I was headed off to college immediately after my first season. And there was actually a gentleman who rode in my raft and he took one look at me and said, oh, you're headed to college. You need to go out for crew when you get there. And I had never heard of crew before and had no intention of getting into sports when I went off to college. I was going to Western Washington University so that I could you know, ski Mount Baker all the time. <laughs> and when I got to Western, I figured out that the team had already won two NCAA national championships and was highly competitive. And so I just went out for the team, you know, at five o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and I immediately got hooked because it was really cool to be exercising that early in the day, to be out on the water. You know, we rode on Lake Samish and it was just stunningly beautiful and so I ended up sticking with it for all four years. And when I graduated, we had won our sixth consecutive national championship. So as you can imagine, it was pretty addicting being on such a highly competitive team. Oh, no doubt. What a time to to jump aboard. No no pun intended there. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's such a beautiful, graceful sport. I grew up in Connecticut and would watch the the local schools rowing on the, the Thames River down there. And you're right, you know, early morning a row, the the water is crystal, you know, it was like glass, I guess. And just watching those people row down the river and just hauling. I mean, they, they move in those things. So what a, what a cool experience for you. Yeah, it was great. So that was pretty dynamic to get to row racing shells all winter and then come home and basically row rafts all summer. So spent quite a bit of time on the water. Yeah, that'll keep you fit. No doubt. <laughs> Okay, so rafting. There was a uh, there was a trip, Colorado trip down through the Grand Canyon. How did you get involved in this? Because it wasn't a normal trip that you would have guided at, at that time, right? Yeah, the water that I guided up here in Alaska was pretty much just flat water. You know, some class one and two 
probably the biggest thing I'd ever rode was class three. And so there was a gal that I was working with and she had gotten an invite to go on this Grand Canyon trip, which is actually 225 miles, not 25. So it's a 25 day rafting trip and you cover 225 miles through the Grand Canyon, starting at <laughs> Lee's Ferry. It makes a difference. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't realize I said that. Sorry. That's okay. A mile a day would be pretty leisurely. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. But we started at Lee's Ferry and then went all the way down to Diamond Creek. So this gal said she had gotten invited and I basically piped up and said, I want to go. <laughs> and she introduced me to her trip leader, this guy named Travis. And I met Travis for coffee and just said, hey, I want to go on this trip. And he said, well, can you row a boat? And I was like, yeah, I can row a boat. And he's like, great. Well, we need another boat captain. So you're in. Well, this girl, girl that I knew ended up bailing on the trip. And so all of a sudden it was myself at 22 years old and 15 people I'd never met before besides this guy, Travis, for you know coffee one time. And I ended up getting a map and starting to read up about the trip. And I realized, oh this is some of the biggest whitewater in North America. You know, it's not even (laughs) on a class one to five system. It's class one to 10. Wow. And I had just graduated from college and I spent the entire summer and fall saving up money for this trip because we were leaving December 26th. So immediately after Christmas, I was going to fly down to Arizona by myself, meet up with this group of people who were also from Alaska and then hop on the river with them for a month. And I just remember sitting at my kitchen table with my dad preparing for this trip and just sobbing because I'm looking at these rapids like Lava Falls and Crystal and uh, Sock Dolliger and all these big, scary names. And I was like, Dad, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, I'm going to kill people. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, I'm supposed to row this 18 foot. 3000 pound raft with two other people in it. And I've never done anything like this before. And it was super freaking scary. And that's actually how my love of dehydrated food was born. Cause I ended up packing about 50 pounds of dehydrated food for this trip. Cause I knew that I wanted to eat really healthy, partially cause I was so damn scared of whether or not I was going to have the energy to <laughs> row this boat down the river. <laughs> Oh, I bet you burn the energy off in fear alone. Mm-hmm, exactly. So that ended up being the first uh, rafting trip through the Grand Canyon that I've done. And I just came off of my fourth trip down there uh, this past February. So to say the least, it all worked out just fine. And now it's my favorite place on the planet. That's cool. It didn't scare you permanently away from it. No, nope. no, that's the crazy part about the Grand Canyon is... Folks ask me all the time, like, how have you managed to go four times the last six years? And in the wintertime, typically in December, January, and February, not very many people apply for those permits because it's pretty dang cold down there. You know, we've had nights where it's only 10 degrees and you wake up and the tent is frosty and the straps on the raft are completely frozen and your hand wash is completely frozen and you end up having to work really hard because it's so darn cold down there. But the great part about it is that it's easy to get permits. You can go for up to 30 days and you can bring 16 people and as many rafts as you want. And then you can collect firewood throughout the entire trip. So we've gotten really fortunate that we've just kept applying for these winter uh, permits and gotten really lucky because you'll talk to plenty of people who have waited 10, 15, 20 years to get a Grand Canyon permit and have never gotten one. Oh, I'll bet you move ahead a, a few months into the, the summer and it's a completely different experience. You can't get a permit and it's even if you do, it's probably a mob scene trying to get down that river with plenty of neighbors. Yeah, exactly. So we've been really fortunate to have the whole river to ourselves. Every time I've gone, we'll maybe run into two or three other groups of people. And when you haven't seen other people for a few weeks, it's pretty fun to meet up with another group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I think you just gave away the secret, so you might have neighbors next time. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, it's it's cold enough that only us crazy Alaskans would be willing to go down there this time of year. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but So tell me some of the stuff that you experienced on the river, some of the, the rapids and some of the stories that came out of uh, of one of these trips. 
Sure. So the Grand Canyon is such a unique place because you go down there and you have these big, beautiful, sandy beaches. And you have to be really aware of the change in the water levels, depending on when they're releasing water from the dam. Because our first night getting down there, we parked our boats, we unloaded everything. Because typically we bring six 18-foot rafts and we have everything you could possibly want. It's like car camping. And so we unloaded all the gear and, of course, set up our great big fire pan and got a big old fire raging. And we actually set up a a sauna as well, which is basically a big Coleman tent with the floor cut out of it. And (laughs) we would put uh, railroad ties in there that we heated up in the fire and then pour water on that to create the sauna. And that was super fun, like great first night of the trip. But we woke up in the morning and the water had dropped so much that our boats were high and dry by about 30 yards. And you can imagine moving these great big heavy boats back into the river was a bit of a team effort, basically getting all 16 people hauling these boats back to the river. So I distinctly remember that immediately as a group, we really had to learn to work together because we were going to come up against stuff that not one person could do on their own, or maybe not even three people could do on their own. A lot of times you did have to have all 16 people working together in order to make things go smoothly. So that was a really eye-opening experience for me was just to see how important this big group dynamic was. And I've seen that on every trip that I've been on. And then after that, we came up to the first big rapid, which is called House Rock. And it's this great big swooping corner where the water comes down and all basically pushes into the left side wall. And it creates this, these really big holes that you're basically trying to keep your boat out of (laughs) by staying on the inside of the corner. And I just distinctly remember going up onto the rocks above this rapid to scout it, which is what we would do for all the big rapids and taking a look at it and not knowing, you know, if I was going to be able to be strong enough to get this boat through, because basically you're going to enter and have to pull back away from the wall throughout the entire rapid. Otherwise you might end up in a big boat flipping hole at the bottom. And so it's just a ton of adrenaline. It's super scary. You know, you've got your passengers who are cheering you on, but they're nervous too because they don't want you to screw it up. They don't want to (laughs) have to swim. And what I found to be the best thing for me on this trip was just following somebody else that was a much more experienced boater than I was. And so I had my friend Jason on the trip, or he became one of my good friends by the end of the trip. I didn't know him when we first started. But I just followed him through every single rapid on that river, you know, basically tailgating him (laughs) through every rapid. And sure enough, I managed to make it through every single big rapid. I think there's 30 something of them on the river uh, without flipping a boat or without tearing a hole in it or losing my customers or anything. So it ended up being a very big success for me. Wow, that's trial by fire right there. All of your your biggest fears and nightmares, you know, here you're facing this wall of water <laughs> coming around the house rock. That's crazy. Yeah, and that's what I imagine for folks who, you know, maybe have a little bit of boating experience or they really want to get into rafting. A Grand Canyon trip is perfect for that just because it is really big water. But there's not a lot of rocks. There's not a lot of strainers. There's not a lot of trees. So the hazards, there's actually not as many down there compared to other rivers that you might run into. Yes, it's super remote. And if you get hurt, you're going to get flown out by helicopter. But the rapids themselves tend to be pretty forgiving. So are you running a, it, this, it sounds like it's a boat that it's only you rowing mm-hmm. from the middle, right? This is not where you have your, your uh, customers rowing with you at the same time on the sides. Yep. For these boats, you typically have a center mount frame and then one person is oaring from the center of the boat. I did guide paddle rafts in Colorado for a season and Honestly, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like not being in control of my boat, <laughs> having other people doing the paddling. So I'm much more comfortable in an oar frame. <laughs> so you, you like to hold the wheel is what you're saying. Yeah, pretty much. 
Yeah, that's the only kind of rafting I've done is where I've they've given me a paddle and I've been there and they're just yelling at you to turn left, turn right, and uh, it's still a blast. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, it's a good time. So where do you guys end up putting in? Obviously, it's downstream of the Glen Canyon Dam, but is it pretty? Uh, is it pretty close to the dam itself, or? Yep, I believe it's about 11 miles down from Glen Canyon Dam. So typically the way the triple work is we all meet up in Flagstaff and then we usually use Pro River Outfitters. So they supply us with the boats and all the gear and we simply need to come with our dry suits and helmets and PFDs and things like that. But then they drive us to the put-in, which is at Lee's Ferry, and then they drop us off and say, all right, like we'll see you 25 days from now at Diamond Creek. And so over the course of that 25 days, you have, like I say, about 225 miles to cover unless you go all the way to Pierce Ferry, in which you get an additional five days if you're going to go that far. And it's an additional 50 miles. So you have to be really strategic about covering enough distance but also not just flying down the whole river and finding yourself kind of waiting to get out at the end. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> camping for five days, waiting for the van to show yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's always a really fun part of the Grand Canyon because there's so many different campsites and you'll never stay at all of them. But you definitely sit down with your map and you figure out, okay, if we have 25 days to cover 225 miles, Maybe we go 10 miles the first day and we go 15 the next day and then 17 the day after that. But then we're going to stay put at this campsite for two or three nights. And then, oh, really? yeah, and then you'll go 20 miles and then maybe 25, then maybe 10 again and get yourself to another really good campsite that you want to spend two, three or four nights at. That's the other great part about these winter trips is you can occupy these campsites for as long as you like because nobody's waiting for you to move out. <laughs> That's cool. I bet everybody uh, appreciates a little break uh, at the same time. I'm thinking you're on the water every single day. That's uh, That would be an insane trip. I mean, 25 days anyway, even if uh, you're staying over for a, a night or two on the side of the river, it's still a really long trip. Yeah, absolutely. This past trip we did, like I say, was 30 days. And it's amazing just how at the end of that trip, it feels like this is how life is. You wake up, you eat breakfast, maybe you're cooking breakfast for everybody, maybe you're making coffee for everybody, you pack up your campsite, you get the boats loaded, you get on the water, you spend four, five, six, seven hours boating, and then you get to camp, you unload everything, you make dinner, you make a fire, you play games, you go to bed. And it's just this incredible rhythm that starts to develop and it really, by the end of it, feels like, okay, this is my life. This is how I operate every single day. And it's pretty addicting. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the best feeling? It usually takes you a, a couple of days to even get into that rhythm. I know on motorcycle trips or back backpacking trips, it's just a, a day or two till you can finally you know, kind of catch your stride. And that, like you said, it is how you live. That is living at that point in time. And when you can do that for an extended period of time, it's a uh, and it's nothing better. You just hate for that last day to show up. Yeah, exactly. I'm hoping that we'll go, you know, every winter if we can. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, that sounds awesome. So let's talk about pack rafting a little bit. You've done quite a bit of pack rafting yourself. We had somebody on the the show uh, and talked about pack rafting, but I've um, I've recently got more interested in it. So help me out. Um, assume I know nothing about it and kind of explain how, what pack rafts are, how they work, how do you use them? Yeah, great question. So for pack rafting, imagine that you have a small personal size raft that weighs about five pounds when it's all rolled up. And you also have a, a kayak paddle that breaks down into two or four pieces. So you maybe just have the blades and then two pieces of the shaft that go together. And you're able to roll this boat up and break down this paddle and stuff it in your backpack and take it wherever you want to go. And I was first introduced to pack rafts up here in Alaska when I was working for Chugach Adventure Guides because we had a couple of them that we could borrow as guides. And we, we all quickly figured out these boats are awesome. <laughs> they can take a beating. They're super lightweight. You can access some really cool remote rivers that nobody else can get to. Because that's why they're so popular here in Alaska. 
is because there's a lot of rivers that you simply can't drive to the put in. You maybe have to hike there or fly there or whatever the case may be. So suddenly having a boat that allows you to hike up and over a mountain pass and then drop into a uh, river drainage and float out the rest of the trip, it's the most incredible thing in the world. So Alpaca is the company that I really like the most, and they're the only boats that I'll ever use. But they're made in Durango, Colorado. And like I mentioned before, even though they're super lightweight and really packable, you can literally drag these things over rocks, through the brush, uh, you know, through around some cactus, and they hold up so flippin' well. So we use them a lot in the Grand Canyon, and we also use them a lot up here in Alaska for a lot of remote rivers. Yeah, I wondered how durable they are, because if they're light enough to carry without being this, you know, 90-pound pack with all your other stuff, you know, you got to think that they would be thin material. It's super thin material. I don't know what exactly it is, but they are super bulletproof, and they're also super easy to patch if you ever were to, you know, manage to get a hole in one. <laughs> <laughs> so... As far as uh, controllability, how do they compare to, they're not a kayak, I mean, they are a raft, but how do they compare to a, a one-man kayak? That's a good question. So the new boats that Alpaca has put out has a pointed bow and stern, and so they do track pretty well in the water, you know, not as well as a sea kayak or even a whitewater kayak, but they do fairly well with these pointed bows and sterns, whereas before they used to be shaped like little donuts, so they didn't <laughs> track very well in the water. <laughs> they just kind of floated. Yeah, exactly. And then what a lot of people will do is actually put thigh straps inside their boat so that it's more comparable to an inflatable kayak or something like that. And so these straps that you put on the inside of the boat then allow you to kind of control the boat with your legs as well, so you have a bit more stability there. And then they also have whitewater skirts. So you put it up over the top of you underneath your life jacket, and then this skirt will attach to the boat very similar to a whitewater kayak would. So suddenly mm -hmm. you're keeping water out, you have some control with your hips, and you also have some pretty good traction. And the boats are so lightweight, you can get from one side of the river to the other in a hot second. So they're pretty dang maneuverable, and you see people running some really big white water in them. So are these something that fold up small enough to actually put inside your pack, or they do they become a pack themselves? Uh, you can put them inside your pack. That's what I typically do, just to protect the boat a little bit if you are bushwhacking. But you can also strap them to the outside of your uh, backpack. So they definitely roll up small enough, though, that you can kind of put them in the very bottom of your pack and make that almost the heaviest thing you take with you. No, that's cool. Yeah, I envision, envisioned them the first time. Like that was, I couldn't imagine it rolling up as small as it does. So I'm kind of thinking, okay, your pack is this raft. You, Where do you carry everything else? But it sounds like it more rolls up into a, more of a large sleeping bag. Yeah. You know, when I did one of my first backcountry pack rafting trips up at Denali National Park, I my pack was unreasonably heavy, but I had a pack raft, a paddle, a life vest, a dry suit, a helmet, a tent, a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad, a bear canister with three days worth of food. <laughs> you know, it was unbelievable how much stuff fit into the 65 liter pack. And like I say, it was heavy, but I had everything to go boating and to camp for this trip. So it was pretty impressive. Wow, that's a, that's a big pack. That's a lot of weight. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of heavy packs, what a perfect segue uh, into Heather's Choice and how you ended up getting into the dehydrated food business. There's a, a bit of a story behind that. Yeah. So like I mentioned, for that first Grand Canyon trip, I had been following a pretty stringent paleo diet. And so when I looked at the menu that the outfitter was supplying for us on that 25-day trip, I wasn't overly impressed and there wasn't a lot of stuff on there that I was really excited about eating. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to pack a lot of my own food. That way I have the snacks that I want, the breakfast and any additional meals that I might need. And so I ended up buying a small five tray Excalibur dehydrator. Folks can get those online at Amazon for, you know, 70 or 80 bucks. And I ended up dehydrating 
uh, ground turkey jerky, a whole bunch of instant purple sweet potatoes, <laughs> and I made fruit leathers and trail mixes and packaroons and just a ton of different stuff. And it was so awesome to eat so well on the river. And so that was kind of the first time that I started to joke around about this idea of starting my own line of food. I was like, oh yeah, that would be neat to have a line of food and I'd probably call it Heather's Choice. And it wasn't less than two years later that I was doing a lot more pack rafting trips and once again, needing to fit a whole lot of food into a fairly small space, you know, maybe three or four days worth of food. And I realized that I couldn't pack all of my healthy whole foods into these bear canisters. I really needed to have stuff that was lightweight and small. And so with my Excalibur dehydrator, I started actually putting some of my home cooked meals onto the dehydrator trays. Like I make a really good marinara sauce with ground moose meat and spaghetti squash. (laughs) That's kind of my signature dish. (laughs) But I would put that on the dehydrator trays, dry it out overnight, and then the next day realize, wow, you know, if I put this in a quart size Ziploc bag, I can take it camping with me. It doesn't weigh hardly anything and it's a full blown meal. So it ended up just kind of developing that I started dehydrating more and more meals, more and more food, doing more and more recipe development, and finally started handing out samples to my friends who were also going on pack rafting trips up here in Alaska and started to get really, really, really good feedback because a lot of folks were eating Mountain House, which is a freeze-dried food product, and they were really psyched to have something that was healthier for them. It was dehydrated and homemade. So come August of 2014, I actually launched my own website, heatherschoice.com, and started selling some of my original meals, like mom's piscetti, sockeye salmon chowder, uh, my coconut packaroons, things like that. And now we're coming up on two years old, and it has been awesome. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. Uh, I've been super busy, and people from all over the world have been anxious to get their hands on some really healthy, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, dehydrated meals for their backcountry trips. Yeah, and I want to talk about the the gluten-free, dairy-free part, but I wanted to to mention that I've tried some of your stuff. I had, uh, you do breakfasts as well. So I did a, a strawberry uh, buckwheat breakfast and I really enjoyed it. I mean, I felt you know, I sit it in front of a computer all day and uh, you can get pretty lethargic after breakfast or after lunch, you know, while eating one of these things or uh, eating some, you know, normal meal. But after I ate this, this breakfast out of your collection, um, I just felt like I had a lot of energy throughout the morning and I was pretty impressed with that. And I thought, okay, that's, that's what you want on the trail, you know, or, or doing any activity out, out in the, in the wilderness, uh, as you want a good hearty meal that keeps you going all day. Um, that tastes good and you didn't have to drag a lot of weight in, in with you. So I tried that. I tried your packaroons, of course. I don't think anybody could complain about your packaroons. <laughs> and then your uh, smoked salmon snacks were amazing. In fact, I ate half of them just as snacks and I used the other half in some, uh, in some scrambled eggs the, the next morning. Ooh. And- yeah, that was awesome. That was a good breakfast right there. So I love your selection. You do breakfast, you do uh, regular entrees, and then you have some dessert items. So you got a little bit of everything for everybody. Yeah. My ultimate goal is to have a full day's worth of calories for people. So someone could come and say, hey, Heather, I'm headed out on a five-day trip. You know, I need five days worth of food. And I could just simply send them five gallon-sized Ziploc bags packed with all the calories that they need. So that's what I'm really striving for. <laughs> Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, let's talk about the the portion size and the calories inside because the you know some of the the competitors in this industry um there are some big meals and a lot of the, a lot of the the packages you see, you know, feeds two, but most people that eat them don't eat them that way. Like I'll find myself out on a backpacking trip and I'll cook one of these. Of course, everybody brings their own meal and I'll cook one and you know, halfway th- through or two thirds of the way through, I'm full. I don't want to eat anymore. But at the same time, I don't want to leave cooked food around. I don't want it in my pack. You can't throw it out while you're out there. So you wind up eating more than you want to. And you just kind of, you're not feeling so great afterwards and not to mention the sodium involved in some of these meals. So you took a different approach with your meals. Yeah. My, really my goal with Heather's Choice is to provide 
balanced meals, so a balanced amount of protein, carbs, and fat. I want them to be calorically dense because a lot of these companies will advertise that their meals contain two servings, but it's only two 300 calorie servings, which to me, that's one meal, <laughs> especially in the back country. And I also wanted to produce something made with ingredients that I was really proud of. So like I said before, we use wild caught Alaskan sockeye salmon for our sockeye salmon chowder. We use 100% grass fed bison for the dark chocolate chili. We also have antelope medicine and quail. And with our entrees, they weigh four ounces and they pack somewhere between five and 600 calories per bag. So we're getting, you know, somewhere in the range of 100 to 150 calories per ounce. And what you're going to see is that our nutrition facts show that there's a moderate amount of fat. And the only reason why we don't have a higher fat content is because fats can go rancid when they're dehydrated. So we make sure to use lean proteins and don't add a lot of extra fat to our recipes. There's going to be a substantial amount of carbs, but not so much that's going to leave you feeling bloated. So anywhere from 50 to 75 grams of carbs per meal is going to be really uh, satiating. And then finally, we're going to have about 30 to 50 grams of protein per bag because we put about a six ounce portion of salmon or a quarter pound of meat in every meal. And protein is really the macronutrient that registers in the brain as yes, I am full, I have eaten. <laughs> and so if you have a meal that doesn't include a lot of really dense animal proteins, you won't ever really get that sense of, yes, I'm satisfied. So by having quite a bit of protein in our dinners, not only do you feel satiated rather than bloated, but you also get a really good amount of necessary protein, which is hard to find in a lot of other backcountry foods. You know, a lot of other Backpacking meals or backpacking snacks are much more carbohydrate and sugar oriented rather than focusing on high quality protein. Yeah, right. Well, even you're even saving the weight too, I'm sure, if you look at the the actual weight of the package between the two, where you're getting good wholesome food that keeps you going for longer versus, you know, a bunch of junk that gets burned through way too quickly. You know, that's uh you're talking about a different pack, a lighter pack at the same time. Yeah, and I've I've had people who have really mentioned to me that they packed Heather's Choice for some of their trips, and it saved them over a third of the space that they typically would use with other freeze-dried meals, because dehydrated food is actually smaller than its freeze-dried counterparts. So even if you had the same amount of calories, you would notice that Heather's Choice meals do pack down quite a bit smaller since they're dehydrated instead of freeze-dried. Yeah, that's a good point. I wanted you to go in a little bit about what the difference is between a dehydrated meal and a freeze-dried meal. Sure. So with freeze-dried food, you have some pluses with that for sure. It's a little bit lighter weight. It is a little bit faster to rehydrate, and it might maintain a little bit more of the micronutrient value compared to dehydrated food. So that's why a lot of companies gravitate towards it. However, the reason I love dehydrated food is because it's really approachable. Like I can teach somebody else how to make this stuff. And again, it's really true to how I started the business. And it's more in line with kind of what I want to promote, which is a bit more of sustainability and self-sufficiency. Because dehydrated food requires a lot less energy than freeze drying. Freeze drying is a pretty intensive process where with dehydrating, you're taking a raw or cooked product and simply adding a little bit of air movement and heat in order to remove the moisture. And that's all you're doing to it. So dehydrated food is going to be, like I say, a little bit smaller. And it's also going to have a comparable amount of protein, fat, and carbohydrate as freeze-dried. And like I say, it's a less energy intensive process. So in my mind, it's a little bit more sustainable than freeze drying. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's, uh, I agree, it's in, it's in, in line with uh, the, the rest of your company's beliefs. What, what does the food, the, you know, the taste, does it change whether you're, between whether you're dehydrating it or freeze drying? Or can you not tell the difference? You would notice a really big difference in texture. So with freeze-dried food, like I said, it takes up a little more space because it's almost as if it's puffed. <laughs> so if you were ever to right. have freeze-dried strawberries, they would taste 
I don't, I kind of want to say styrofoamy, like they're kind of mm-hmm. crunchy. Whereas if you were to have dehydrated strawberries, they would be smaller and they would be gummier. So definitely there's a huge difference if you're eating raw, uh, freeze dried or dehydrated food. But then as far as the cooked food, I really like dehydrated because it tastes just like it would have coming off the stove. The only difference is that we, like I say, removed the moisture from it. So when you rehydrate it, it's not going to rehydrate to the exact same size that it was originally, but it's going to be pretty darn close. Because if I take a pound and a half of chocolate chili and I dehydrate it down to about four ounces, once you add, say, a cup and a quarter of hot water to it to rehydrate it, you're going to end up with, you know, 14 ounces of food to eat. So it ends up being really freaking satiating. <laughs> it's a lot of food yeah, that we no stuff doubt. into that bag. <laughs> and did you catch that listeners? Chocolate chili? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one, one I need to order up too. <laughs> Actually, I have the uh, sockeye salmon on order. I don't know if you saw that order come in, but I'm waiting for that to show up because that's uh, I want to try that one. Yeah, that absolutely. We're waiting for more fish to come in. We actually harvest all of our salmon in July because that's when the sockeye run is up here. So yeah. we're going to be slaying a whole lot of fish here soon. <laughs> well, how cool that it's sourced locally like that too. I mean, up in Alaska, it's it's sourced in Alaska and packed right there on the spot. I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we're having fun with it. Yeah. I also wanted to point out, uh, I mentioned it in the intro, but all of your, the knowledge about uh, putting meals together for people out on the move um, and in, in adventurous hobbies, it comes from your education, your background in, in uh, evolutionary sports uh, nutrition. Explain a little bit what that means. I've never heard <laughs> the term evolutionary sports nutrition. I've, I've, I understand sports nutrition, but so what does that encompass, that education? So where I went to school at Western Washington University, I also attended a school within the school called Fairhaven. And Fairhaven College is an interdisciplinary program where you are encouraged to develop your own concentration. And you basically write a 20 some odd page justification for what your concentration is going to be. And I had chosen evolutionary sports nutrition as mine. So what I was really focusing on was nutritional anthropology, as well as biology, physiology, kinesiology, all of the hard sciences, and then combining that with food sustainability and mindfulness and well-being. So there was a lot of moving parts to this uh, undergraduate degree. But what I came out of it with was basically this understanding that we as humans evolved over millions of years with primarily a hunter-gatherer-based diet. And so we would have been out there either collecting fish or hunting wild animals or picking roots and tubers, nuts and seeds, things like that. And that's what our diet would have primarily consisted of. And so we only saw that change in the last 10 to 15,000 years with the advent of agriculture. And that's when people started moving towards more of a grain and bean and dairy based diet. And evolutionary sports nutrition basically argues that our bodies are best suited for the diet that more closely resembles our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And that for us as athletes, we're going to operate better and perform better and be healthier for a longer period of time if we can eat in such a way that's more in line with our human evolution. So that means that we're eating a lot more lean meats, uh, fresh produce, healthy fats, and we're steering away from the more carbohydrate rich sports nutrition plans that you see today. You know, for me as a college athlete, I was told that I needed to eat more bagels, more low fat dairy, and more oatmeal. (laughs) That was basically the things that I needed to be eating. Right. And for any college athletes out there, they probably heard the exact same thing. Where again, with more of an evolutionary approach to that, we would be saying, hey, you need to be focusing on your protein intake, making sure it's coming from healthy sources, get your carbohydrates from fruits and vegetables, and make sure you're eating plenty of high quality fats that are very anti-inflammatory. So your meals basically take take on the paleo approach. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. And that's, there's a little bit of flexibility with that. Like we use white basmati rice for our Ethiopian dorawat. 
And I feel comfortable with that because it's a gluten-free grain. It is a really clean uh, source of starch. And it's also, like I say, a dairy and soy-free meal. Uh, We're also staying away from corn because a lot of folks have gluten, soy, dairy, and corn intolerances. So I would say that it's a paleo template uh, with the flexibility to move around a little bit. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I, I got to be honest, when uh, the whole paleo thing started coming about, uh, about a few years ago, you know, I, I had kind of looked at it as, well, ah, it's another diet fad, you know, <laughs> it's just, just another one of those things. And, you know, but it's only been uh, recently that I've started looking into it a little bit uh, more heavily. And, and as a, you know, I'm not a professional out doing, you know, these adventure activities. These are, I'm a weekend warrior, like most of us. And, you know, when you sit in front of a, a desk or sitting in a desk in front of a computer, or you're, you know, commuting to and from work and you have a, a high carb diet, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you're not sitting there burning carbs, you know, as you, you might be if you're on the trail all day or doing something athletic all day. So I started paying attention to it more and it actually, it really does make a lot of sense to me to, to lay off that stuff and, and go back to, to, like you said, back to how our ancestors ate you know, before the agricultural uh, industry kicked in. Yeah. And I think it's helpful for people to understand that your body really only needs carbohydrates when it's operating above 70% of your max heart rate. Otherwise, ideally you should be burning fat for fuel. So if I'm sitting here waving my hands, getting excited, (laughs) no, I'm not jacking my heart rate up and I shouldn't be burning sugar. Ideally, I should be mobilizing my own fat stores instead So that's why a paleo diet is so advantageous for athletes, because if you're even, say, a marathon runner and you're going to go and run a fairly long distance or you're an ultra marathon runner, you're not going to be cooking through sugar that entire time if you can keep your heart rate moderately low and you can, like I say, motor along at, say, 60 percent your heart rate heart rate and be cooking through fats instead And that gives you a performance advantage because you have unlimited fat stores. Even a very lean individual has hundreds of thousands of fat calories to burn through. Whereas your sugar stores, you can only store about three to 400 grams in your muscles and a hundred in your liver. So if you're, you know, cooking through sugar during a marathon or ultra marathon, you're going to have to replenish that stuff pretty dang quickly and pretty frequently as well. So that's why you see people bonk at mile 20 of a marathon because they haven't been replacing that sugar they've been cooking through. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So when you're on a a paleo diet, you're essentially just getting rid of processed foods and sugars as well as dairy and grains. That's about the, the gist of it, right? Exactly. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of good food that you could be eating. It's not like you're on a diet and you can't eat anything good because obviously you get some really good stuff in a paleo diet, but you're getting rid of the the stuff that just turns into fat, you know, later on with uh with your what uh, your dormant active or dormant uh lifestyle, I guess is what I'm getting at. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, I'm going to look more into that and read a little bit up on it myself. Yeah. If folks want to learn more, the book that I recommend hand over fist is the primal blueprint by Mark Sisson. That will, that is a worthwhile read for anybody and everybody. I've gotten a copy for my mom, my dad, my stepdad, <laughs> like anybody I meet. I want them to read that book because it's so eye opening. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. In fact, I'll, that's a good tip. I'll put that in our, our bookstore so people can find it over in the, the podcast bookstore. Yeah, it's wonderful. Okay. Before we leave the uh, Heather's Choice stuff, I wanted to bring up price um, because I think a lot of people will, uh, it happens all the time in, in any market. Um, if you're making a, a, a tactile product or you're making a consumable product, people will always compare prices. But I wanted to bring it up because when people visit your site, they're going to see that your food is, is more expensive than the other items in, you know, as from the competitors. So what I want you to do is explain why these prices are, are higher. It's, you know, because of the, the food, the quality ingredients that you're getting in this instead of filler that they might be getting in uh, competitor <laughs> stuff. Yeah, great question. So you already hit the nail on the head there. People are going to be shocked when they see that our entrees are twice as much as a typical mountain house or other competitors meal. And so our entrees run about $15 each. 
And the reason for that is because we start off with these high quality proteins like grass fed bison that cost close to 1050 a pound. And we put like substantially more protein in each package than any other company will. So if you're getting a quarter pound of bison in every entree, you're getting almost $3 worth of bison in that bag. And that's not counting all of the onions and the yams and the tomatoes and the spices and all the other good ingredients. But the other part that I think people really don't understand is how much effort goes into every bag because we have to source all of the ingredients. So we order all of those up. We chop them up into quarter inch pieces so that they're ready to be cooked together. We cook the whole meal in a great big pressure cooker. So we usually do 50 batches at a time. We then spread that food onto the dehydrator trays and it can take close to 24 hours for the food to be fully dehydrated before it's ready to package. That dehydrated food is then measured out into individual bags Somebody seals the bag, somebody stickers the bag with the batch number, and then it's ready to ship. So essentially, you know, three or four days worth of effort goes into every batch of food. So that's been really interesting for me to see, but then to also explain to people, you know, when I'm talking about the price, it's like, well, I basically have $10.50 invested into each bag for ingredients and labor. And then my bag also cost me an additional $1.50. So for every $15 meal, it costs us $12 to make it. (laughs) So so you can imagine that we're not getting rich really fast and we don't have huge profit margins. So it's not like we're making this stuff for $3 a bag and selling it for $15. Instead, we're putting $12 worth of effort into every single meal and asking for $15 in exchange. Yeah, and clearly, you know, part of it is is because it's a small company and you know, small companies just don't have the buying power or the manufacturing power of larger companies. So there's there's a bit of it there, but the other larger piece of it is it's it's uh you you, you get what you pay for. You know, if you if you don't mind, you know, the extra filler and the grains and high sodium content, then you can save money, but it's it's like walking into Walmart and buying the the cheap you know, version of anything, any product versus the the quality one that'll last you a long time. You're talking about quality foods. You're, you're actually going to make your health last quite a bit longer. So it's not, not exactly an apples to apples comparison when you look at these two types of meals. Yeah. And I, I actually imagine it too with pack rafts. Like I was, you know, singing the praises about this pack raft that I own and how, you know, I have used that thing aggressively for the last four years. And I don't know that I will ever need to buy another boat. If I take care of this one, it's mm-hmm. a $1,500 investment. <laughs> and same with a dry suit is probably a thousand dollar investment. But again, if you invest in it and you get the good stuff, you shouldn't have to buy it again or replace it. And, you know, I imagine the same thing with food, as far as the quality goes, like you said, you get what you pay for. And if you buy yourself really healthy, high quality food, you're going to find that you can get further down the trail without having to refuel again. Yeah. And I think that's really important for, for people that are out there and, and serious about doing it. I mean, it's one thing if you're just going out, you know, camping one night or something like that, but if you're loading your pack up and you're going out for multi days, it starts to make a difference in what you purchase and what do you put in that pack? And then, you know, it, it makes a difference in what pack you buy, what, quality sleeping bag. I mean, it all comes down to you get what you pay for. So yeah, for sure. And, you know, one thing that I mentioned before, the reason why I love dehydrated food so much is because I can teach other people how to do it. And so if folks are completely shocked by the sticker, and they just can't justify purchasing our meals for $15 a bag, I would definitely encourage them to keep their eyes peeled on our website, because I'm working on an ebook right now, which will show people exactly how to make their own dehydrated meals and snacks for adventures. And so that might be something that's useful to them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you can uh, even mix it up. You know, there's times when you have the time to, to make your own dehydrated meals. And then there's times when you just need to get some stuff on hand to take that trip because you ran out of time. I, I know how that feels. <laughs> it yeah. seems like every trip I go on, it's like, oh, I got to stock up on these couple of items. And often the dehydrated meals are uh, are one of those items. So. Right. Food's the last thing that people think about for their trips. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> 
Exactly. So the website is heatherschoice.com. Go check out all of the awesome offerings that Heather has on her site. And I'm sure you have more products in development at the same time. You're probably always getting nerdy in the kitchen and, and thinking about what else you could make for that uh, tastes pretty good. Oh, yeah. We're working on chicken mole. So that's a lot of taste testing going on. <laughs> yeah. Sign me up. Send me some samples. I'll taste test. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right on. All right. Well, before we uh, depart, uh, what I want to do is have you tell me a couple of quick stories about your best and worst days on the river. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, You know, one of my best days on the river, I had taken a pack rafting trip uh, by myself, actually, into the Grand Canyon. And so I hiked down the Bright Angel Trail, camped at Phantom Ranch, and then hiked about, I think it was 11 miles upstream, and then came down Clear Creek Canyon and pack rafted back to Phantom Ranch. So it's a big loop hike. And it was awesome to have the entire Grand Canyon to myself. I was in this little dinky boat (laughs) on this really big river, and there was nobody else out there. And it was April, so all the cactus were blooming, and it was just stunningly beautiful. And, uh, having this big, beautiful body of water all to yourself was definitely something that I'll never forget. So that was a really great trip. And then that's cool, man. Worst one. It's hard to come up with a worse time on doing something you absolutely love to do, right? Yeah. You know, the first (laughs) thing that comes to mind was that first trip on the Grand Canyon. Like I say, it was late December And I froze my tail off that night. You know, I had a bag liner, a sleeping bag, and then a fleece bag on the outside wearing every layer of clothing I had. And I was still freezing to death. (laughs) And I woke up in the morning and it was snowing. And it snowed on us throughout breakfast. And it continued to snow as we were loading the rafts. And I just remember wearing this big floppy fur hat with my dry suit rowing my boat and I was like what the hell am I doing down here (laughs) (laughs) so freaking cold I have no idea why we're doing this and so it it tends to be uh weather days that get to you the most but that's another reason to love rafting is when you're in your dry suit you can basically get through anything (laughs) and be just fine (laughs) Yeah, isn't that great? That's what I love about do, going up and doing winter hikes and snow cave camping is that it, I'm always enamored with the ability to have the right clothing, quality clothing on so that you can enjoy the environment out there. You know, when it's bitter cold up in the mountains, you know, most people wouldn't set foot up there. So you know, I stay out of the mountains, you know, why would I go hiking or snow, you know, sleep in a snow cave at night? But if you're outfitted correctly, it can be the most wonderful thing because it's, I, I always love this uh, this feeling of self sufficiency, and when you can uh, take that idea into being comfortable in terrible environments, uh, it's it's just a it's an amazing feeling. So I, I get it, I totally do. Yeah, I basically feel like my dry suit with my hood is kind of my my superwoman outfit. <laughs> I can pretty <laughs> much do anything in it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I have to find my Superman outfit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Right on. Well, cool. I mean, thanks for coming on and uh, teaching us about some of the the nutritional stuff on the trail and talking about uh, rafting and teaching me and others about pack rafting. It's been uh, it's been an awesome hour and I can't believe an hour has passed by already. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And if folks have additional questions, they can reach me through the website, heatherschoice.com. And uh, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, all that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get all those linked up in our show notes so people can find them easily. And that should do it. Heather, I thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Travis. Yeah. And to our listeners, uh, until the next episode, get out there and try something new. Maybe it's going to be pack rafting next time. It's something I want to try and uh, another one to put on my list for sure. So, All right, Heather. Thanks. Take Take care. care. (laughs) First of all, Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. 
And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.